Good morning, Excellencies. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, here in the room, but also in our live stream uh, that is now going online. I'm Gabriel Voidelko, and on behalf of Kerber Stiftung, I warmly welcome you to our morning conversation at Munich Security Conference 2024. Guests are still arriving. Please take your seat. We are going to be talking about the past and present of NATO's northern front. And a special welcome goes to two distinguished panelists. That is Kaya Kalas, Prime Minister of the Republic of Estonia, and Mary Elise Sorotti, Professor of History at Johns Hopkins School of um, Advanced International Studies in Washington, DC. Madam Prime Minister, uh, Professor Sorotti, welcome to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as I said, in our conversation, we are going to dig a bit into the last uh, 30 years of NATO's past to explore how that may help us to contextualize what's going on on NATO's northern front today. So two years into the full scale of Russian invasion of Ukraine, 10 years after the annexation of Crimea, it's a year of anniversaries, 20 years of the NATO accession of the Baltic countries and other uh, countries of Central and Eastern Europe. So how can history help us to understand what's going on today? That's what we are here for. And let's start straight away. Madam Prime Minister, if we talk about NATO's Northern Front in 2024, it might look as if we deal with a very homogeneous group of countries, democracies, united, like a close entity. Uh, on the background of history, though, it's a bit more complex. So I would like to ask you uh, how mentally united it is NATO's uh, northern front based on different his historical experiences of, let's say, Estonia and Finland, for example. Mm. Well, actually, I, I would like to start uh, from uh, from uh, why we are here. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, uh, last uh, last summer, uh, well, all my staff knows that I, I like to read, so so they always give me books for my birthday. <laughs> so, uh, one of my, uh, I mean, my foreign affairs advisor, Lee, who's sitting there, gave me this book, uh, Mary's book, uh, Not One Inch. So, uh, it was a nice uh, birthday weekend. Uh, we were with my husband um, in in. In, uh, France Riviera and I was you know sitting on the sunbed and reading this book uh, reading like uh, reading reading uh, this book and, and there was a um, uh, American couple just beside me and and then they asked me is it a good book I said it's a very good book it's a very good book and now uh, 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 so do you recommend it yes I recommend it so um, uh, now but I got to the uh, conclusion when I flew back and I was like how can she come to a such wrong conclusion based on <laughs> such good thorough research? Okay. And I was like, I, I recommended this to the Americans and now they think that this is the right thing, that we should give something to the Russians so that, you know, they would behave better. And, and, and I said that I want to debate her on the conclusion of this book. So, so I recommended the book to everybody, said that read the book, don't read the conclusion. <laughs> okay, so now... Okay, thank you. <laughs> but I can answer your question. No, that's, that's fine. You know, we, we, uh, I thought, you know, how to start and whether to start right away with the book. So you took it out of my yeah, hand. Yeah, I we think it's important to understand. Now. And then I made uh, to Christoph uh, Hoisken, I, I made this proposal that can we have. Uh, on the sidelines of Munich Security Conference that you uh, invite her and we can have this debate finally. So <laughs> yes. we are here. Yeah. We are here, that's what we are here for. So let's move to the book now. Um, uh, so as you said, you have read the book, you liked it, you didn't like the conclusions. Maybe not everyone in the room has already read Mary Sorotti's <laughs> book, Not One Inch, Russia, the US, Russia and the making of Why the not? post Cold War <laughs> stalemate. So might you, would you like to, or can you briefly summarize which of the conclusions you didn't agree with? <laughs> so what is it that made you upset? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so basically, um, uh, the book is a, a really a thorough research uh, on how we got to the uh, uh, enlarged uh, NATO and what were the discussions and, and negotiations uh, uh, on on the way. Uh, but uh, but the conclusion was that. 
like, why, did I, uh, why didn't I like it? Um, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, it, you know, somehow takes in what I've heard in the, in the West uh, uh, a lot, that like Russia has some kind of a, you know, imminent right to the territory, or, or to our territory. So, you know, we could, we should, you know, offer them something to, you know, make them uh, somehow satisfied. <laughs> you know, that has never worked. That has never worked. And, and we were a country before we were occupied. So, so that, forgets about that part. So, so the book starts with the fall of Berlin Wall, but it, it ignores uh, the fact how we got to the Berlin Wall in the first place. <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, our history. The other thing that I see uh, that in the, in the West, uh, it is like the, the, the wish that, oh, if we would do this, Russia would be a democratic country. Yeah. And, and, and there would be, I mean, Gorbachev was a Democrat. No, I mean, Gorbachev, the economy was, was you know, collapsed. And that's why he needed money. And that's why he actually didn't control the processes. Not that they wanted. Uh, and uh, and uh, as soon as they have money, they start to build their war machine and attack their neighbors. Mm. So, so uh, I mean, uh, this this sort of uh, attitude that like the West owes something to Russia because Russia is big and they have nuclear weapon. China is also big and has a <laughs> nuclear weapon, and we don't have that. That we owe them something. We don't owe them anything. So I saw <clears throat> I saw Mary like moving when you, <laughs> when she listened to you. I mean, uh, so I'll give you the I'll give you the, the the possibility to respond, but I think we should first clarify what or we could we should dig a bit deeper into what your arguments are about. So I think the what you are talking about, uh, Madam Prime Minister, is Mary's dealing with the partnership for peace. Uh, um, an arrangement or a framework that has been created in 1994 and it gave the opportunity for countries to cooperate with NATO on, on different levels but not becoming full members, without becoming full members. So, and Mary, you explore the partnership for peace as a kind of potential alternative way <clears throat> to, to bind uh, states closer to NATO. And so what, what would you say... Um, do you feel treated unfair <laughs> now that uh, Madam Prime Minister, <laughs> Prime Minister said you are too generous to well, Russia? Let me say first, it is, is an enormous honor to sit here with you, Madam Prime Minister. I am grateful to you for recommending my book, among other things, to Jens Stoltenberg, with whom I have had the, the privilege to discuss it for two hours. Uh, but I had the same reaction, is how could such a brilliant woman have misunderstood me so badly? Uh, so the book, to be very clear, does not not say Russia has an imminent right to Estonia or other, any other territory. Not so directly, though. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. And it does not say the West owes something to Russia. My, my, my point in the conclusion is a different one. The big play at the end of the Cold War was to do three things. The first was to let your country and other countries into NATO. And to be clear, I am a supporter of NATO enlargement. I am happy it has happened. My issue is with how it happened. So no, the big play, number one, let your country and other countries into NATO. Number two, provide a secure berth for Ukraine in the European order. And people knew at the time that that was a problem. Bill Clinton in 1994 said, you know, we can't just leave Ukraine alone with the Russians. Yeah. And number three, continue disarmament with Moscow. Not because the, you know, the West owes Russia anything, but because it was in the interest of the United States and indeed the entire planet to continue the process of de destroying strategic nuclear weapons. The beginning of the 90s were the greatest moment of disarmament, nuclear disarmament, for this planet. And we wanted to keep that going. So the big play, Madam Prime Minister, and you as a policymaker know how hard this is to pull off. Um, I'm just a, a politically unimportant historian, is to um, get, get countries into NATO, give Ukraine a secure berth, and um, keep nuclear disarmament going with Russia. That's a difficult circle to square. Mm -hmm. But since we're talking about three places, Central and Eastern Europe, Russia and Ukraine, that's actually a triangle. It, so you needed to square that triangle. It is possible to square triangles. And I believe that using the Partnership for Peace as the method of enlarging NATO 
would have increased the chances that we could have done all three at the end of the Cold War. As is, we only achieved the first thing. We got your country and others into NATO, and I'm very glad that happened. But we left Ukraine out in the cold, which people at the time said we should not do this. And the relationship with Russia has completely fallen apart, and we are back to nuclear threats. That is the conclusion of my book. But yeah, but, but this, is, uh, this is, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you treat Russia as it is, you know, some of the countries in the West. We have a principle, Bakhta sunt Saranda, agreements are to be followed. Russia does not have that. I mean, Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal uh, for the promise that Russia would yes. not attack them. So, yes. you know, Ukraine kept the promise on their side, but Russia didn't. <laughs> so, so this belief that, you know, uh, somehow uh, they would behave if we would, uh, you know, make agreements agreements with them. They only want to get the agreements out of the West because they know that we will follow them, you know, uh, you know, in principle and point by point. They only want this uh, uh, agreement to be in place. And, and so, so the disarmament of Russia and, and partnership of peace, I mean, Ukraine and Georgia ha had that. How did that work out so far? Madam Prime Minister, let me... But, um... but just, just one thing. Uh, <laughs> No, no, well, on, on Ukraine. Uh, no, I, I, that was very fascinating to, to read also the discussions regarding Ukraine there. Uh, I mean, yeah. that we don't let, uh, leave uh, Ukraine out, out in the cold. Uh, you know, what is the difference, I yeah. think, at that time uh, in, in, in my country uh, or in Ukraine, that they didn't see it the way we did at that time. So we had a short opportunity window where Russia Russia was weaker, and, and by the way, we have a person here, uh, our former ambassador to United States, who was part of the negotiation, so maybe he could also uh, give his input later on. Uh, Thomas, you can wave. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, the, the, point, uh, the point was that, that uh, uh, we had the negotiations, and very, uh, very often the West said, why do you need NATO? Because Russia does not pose a threat anymore. They are, you know, on their democratic path, and, mm -hmm. and you, know, uh, you, you know, you don't need NATO. Uh, but but uh, we saw from our history there's a short opportunity window where we have to use this because that opportunity window closes. And, and we thought we are never going to be alone again because being alone means that we're going to be occupied by, by Russia. So Ukraine yeah. didn't have that, that moment. I mean, didn't work for that. But, so, uh, but, so let Mary, me explain. Mary, me explain. Be before, before you respond, sorry, I have to <laughs> somehow steer I the, to the, the, I, I, salary I just want well. to explain what the book's argument on Ukraine is, just yeah, briefly. Yeah, 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 President but, Bill Clinton, in 1994, when the Central and Eastern European countries came to him and said, we must get into NATO, he said, I understand that. But if I give you Article 5, Poland and Hungary, I will, we just erased the Cold War line through Europe. If I give you Article 5, we will draw a new line between Article 5 Europe and non-Article 5 Europe, and we will leave Ukraine out in the cold with Russia. But we alliances are that. drawing lines. I mean... Uh... Okay, so Mary, <laughs> you have, about drawing lines. Mary, you have the you have the advantage of ha having read all these thousands of sources, and you know we cannot like beat you on that. But let's go back. No, the book is very good. The book, the book, yes, the book the is very is good. But but uh, let's let's move a bit back, um, Madam Prime Minister. You said um, you uh, you. Your country and others in 2004 decided in favor of NATO because you knew that the window of opportunity would be short and you, have, you, have, you had been living under Russian occupation. So what would you say? What, what was the one historical experience that made it very clear to you that full NATO membership was the only way... Security to, guarantee. The only security guarantee because... You also, Estonia was also mm. a part of Partnership for Peace. 
as a, as a preparation to full membership, but why were you clear that you needed full membership? What uh, was it? Yeah, uh, of course, uh, that decision was in 1990s. Uh, so, so also my, my father, I was a teenager and then a student, law student at the time. And I remember, you know, my, my father was a foreign minister and, uh, and held different positions also on the way. So, so how he came home and, and said that, okay, NATO is not going to happen. Okay, maybe European Union. So, so that mm -hmm. was a long process. And by the way, when I go to, uh, I was in Asian security conference and, and one Chinese official was attacking me, you know, uh, NATO expansion and, you know, NATO expanded and like Russia has been promised something um, uh, so that NATO doesn't go. <laughs> so, so I responded, said that we work so hard to get into NATO. So it's not like NATO wanted to somehow expand and yes. this is how we use yes. the words. Mm -hmm. It's not NATO's initiative, it's our initiative mm -hmm. to get in. And, and I was at the panel with the German uh, defense minister and, and said, I mean, they didn't really want us in uh, for a long time. Uh, so, so we worked so hard and, and the, the uh, why is that in 1930s and 1940s, we uh, thought that if we are neutral uh, between two evil mm -hmm. empires, we will be left untouched. Well, uh, we have two choices, either to be with the West or to be with Russia. Uh, we don't have any other choices. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why uh, we decided that we are going to be in all the organizations uh, that it is uh, possible and NATO is the only security guarantee mm -hmm. that there re really is. And when I go to schools to explain what NATO is, I always say, it's, you know, it's like when you have a school bully uh, and you are small in size, weaker, or somehow different, then the school bully doesn't bully you when you have big friends. This is the way NATO <laughs> works. So, so being under the NATO's umbrella, no NATO country has ever been attacked. And, and alliances is about drawing lines. I mean, uh, it is. European Union has lines where we are. Uh, NATO has lines. Uh, so, so the question for me is that uh, all these gray areas are sources of conflict and wars. Mm -hmm. and, and the only thing that is very clear uh, security guarantee is the NATO's umbrella because that is what Russia is afraid of. Well, um... and, uh, and afraid of not because NATO is going to somehow threaten their borders because it's a defensive alliance, but uh, it is a threat to Russian imperialism. They mm -hmm. can't expand their territory if you are under NATO's umbrella because uh, they, why we have, I mean, why Ukraine is living uh, through these dark times and we are not, if you look geographically, we would be so much easier to conquer. I, I agree with everything you just said. But. But <laughs> NATO expansion was not one not thing. Not expansion. NATO don't, enlargement. Don't use whatever. expansion. I, I, I use the, fine, that's fine. <laughs> NATO enlargement was not one thing. There were very, very fierce internal debates over mm -hmm. how to enlarge NATO. So I agree with you that alliances are all about drawing lines. But there are different ways of drawing lines. So, for example, the British at one point said, okay, well, if we're not going to have this kind of intentionally ambivalent solution of the Partnership for Peace. And don't misunderstand, I, I didn't mean countries should stay in that. The whole point of that was it was a face-saving way to enlarge NATO to keep disarmament going with Russia and to provide a berth for Ukraine. And when then Yeltsin turned to bloodshed, he, he had tanks fire on his own parliament in October 1993, and he turned to war in Chechnya. Then especially the Poles, the Hungarians, they all came back and they said, okay, we understood what you were saying, that we shouldn't draw a line and leave Ukraine out in the cold. But now Russia is killing people again, and we're really sorry about the Ukrainians, but we need Article 5. So it was clear at the time that we were leaving Ukraine in the lurch, right? And there were people at the time who said, we really shouldn't do this. Ukraine is the heart of peace in Europe. I mean, I'm reading this as a historian, you know, in 2014 and falling out of my chair. So there were different ways to draw lines. And people at the time said, we can do this in a way that won't leave Ukraine in the lurch and will still get people into NATO. But, but Mary, um, listening to you and the way you passionately explain your argument, yes. um, 
I was wondering, the way you talk about partnership for peace in your book mm. is very much into the, the direction of, let's say, counterfactual history. I mean, you, you, yep. you argue what could have happened if. But how do you avoid um, non-deliberately reinforcing, let's say, pro-Russian narratives uh, in the US and in the West with this kind of argumentation? Because you, you also said, you know, many people have approached you and said, well, you know, it's a good book, but you, you <laughs> draw the wrong conclusion. So what, what would be your argument as a historian? Well, let me take a step back. So I would like to express my profound admiration for the Ukrainians. I, I am horrified by what is happening to them. The reason I published my book in December 2021 was that I was very concerned that Putin would do something violent for the 30th anniversary of the Soviet Union falling apart. I had noticed that he likes to mark anniversaries with violence, and it is such a tragedy that he chose to mark the Munich Security Conference by killing Alexei Navalny, as far as I can tell, another very, very brave man. So I published the book because I was very, very worried that uh, he would use violence on the 30th anniversary of the Soviet Union falling apart, end of December 2021. I forgot about the Chinese Olympics. The Chinese said, you messed up one Olympics for us already in 2008, don't do it again. So we had to wait until after the Olympics. But basically, the, the attempt to take Kiev in three days was his way to celebrate the anniversary of the Soviet Union falling apart. And um, so I wish the war that resulted would end. I wish that Russians would lay down their weapons and go home. I cannot make that happen. I cannot make them disarm. But Putin is using history as a weapon, mm -hmm. and there I can disarm him, because he is twisting the history of NATO enlargement. He is twisting the not one inch story. He is taking a hypothetical comment that was indeed made by the Secretary of State James Baker to the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, but it was a hypothetical comment. He is taking it and saying, oh no, we were betrayed, we were betrayed. He is forgetting that the final treaty on German unification expressly allows NATO to move Article 5 eastward across mm. its front line. And Moscow not only signed this treaty, it ratified it, and it cashed the associated check. Putin never mentions that, right? So I am following the evidence, and I can lay out what happened. Mm -hmm. I also, on the positive side, when I interviewed former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, that's when I became aware, became aware of the potential inherent in the Partnership for Peace. Mm -hmm. Bill Perry, a very smart man, was the man moving spirit behind the Partnership for Peace. And he, his point was that we should make sure NATO enlargement is compatible with disarmament. As he put it, I, Bill Perry, I have huge admiration for the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and how they threw off the yoke of Soviet oppression. But I'm currently engaged in the destruction of strategic nuclear weapons that could end civilization on Earth. That is good for everyone. We need to make sure that that's a priority, and we need to expand NATO in some face-saving way that doesn't alienate the Russians. Mm. That is what I am arguing. Now, obviously, what I am talking about is, is historical and in peacetime. Mm -hmm. We are now in wartime. I do not think the Partnership for Peace or anything like it is a solution now. I think we should be supporting Ukraine as strongly as possible, and I think Ukraine should become a member of NATO. Mm -hmm. So my argument is historical, not current, and I do not, I, I fully reject the idea that I in any way say Russia has any right to Estonian territory mm. or that the West owes Russia anything. That, so I, that, that's my argument. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, uh, uh, yeah I, uh, I think why this book is very good is to, uh, to turn down the argument that they are using that not one inch was promised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it very clearly mm -hmm. shows how it wasn't promised. Correct. So, so this is a very, very good thing to use. Uh, to use against uh, uh, those historical, well, there are a lot of things that are not true that they are telling, but right. the, uh, this not one inch is something that that a lot of people around the world, I mean, uh, in Global South, believe, uh, yes. and uh, and that <clears throat> this was promised. So, so um, I think this is this is a good thing. So, uh, but but the, on the other side, uh, you know, the the approach that I see is totally different. Um, another good historian who has also written very many good books that I also recommend <laughs> is Timothy Snyder. And, and yep. he has said, in order for a country to become
become better. It has to lose its last colonial war. And Russia has never lost its last colonial war. Uh, I mean, uh, all, the, uh, all the other countries uh, that we know that have lost and have become better due to this. So, so the, the argument that I have is that uh, they have to lose this time in order to to have you know to become better uh, not because we sit down and and promise them something and like you say we alienate the russians we can't i mean we we can't do anything to alienate the russians because they don't uh, they don't want to uh, i mean nato is a threat to russian imperialism not to Na uh, russia itself okay. wait, wait wait a moment madam prime minister um, you now you said imperialism uh, shortly before you said uh, russia has to lose its Last, last colonial, colonial war. war. So what is it? Is it that colonialism, is imperialism? It is the Does same. Does it matter? It is the same. <laughs> yeah. well, well, we could it's have in, another... It's, it's in, enlarging its empire or colonies. I mean, I can say that we were Russia's colony. Mm. Like, uh, like uh, I mean, uh, there were mm -hmm. European countries that had colonies in, mm -hmm. in other, uh, in other uh, parts mm -hmm. of the world, like Africa. Mary, um, well, we are now already into the, let's say, the topic of how to deal with Russia. And mm. we mentioned, of course, uh, Ukraine already. So how to deal with Russia? Um, yeah. When would you say, Mary, was the turning point um, for, with regard to aggressive imperial Russian policies after 1989-1991. You mentioned the Chechen wars already. You mentioned the the putsch, uh, Yeltsin using tanks. So, what is the turning point from your point of view? Yeah, uh, let me make three points briefly. And for those but of you briefly. who are interested, <laughs> yes, briefly. And for those of you who are interested, thank you so much. The book is available in both English and German in the bookstore, so you can judge for yourself what my arguments are. Okay. I definitely have to have a percentage of your sales. You do, you definitely do. <laughs> no, as I said, thanks to you, I spent two hours with Jens Stoltenberg discussing this history because he thought it's so important for NATO. So I'm very grateful to you. So briefly, I think the the real point of no return is 1999 when Putin becomes president. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also the Kosovo um, bombing happens and Primakov turns his plan. So I think it's 99, number one. Number two, I think that on the question of how to deal with the Russians now, I believe that we need more of the spirit that Estonians have long shown. And I uh, was talking to your ambassador in the US, and I asked him for a, a saying that summarizes the Estonian spirit. And he taught me, ut cord me Vuidame ni guini. Ah, uh, excord vuidame ni guini. Yes. Uh, one day, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is a saying that means one day, no matter what, we will win. Yeah. Mm. And I have been sensing here at the MSC such a fatalistic spirit. And I think we need more of the Estonian spirit. One day, no matter what, we will win. And third and finally, in practical terms, I believe the best solution for Ukraine, I, I believe the best solution for Ukraine would be for the Russians to lay down their weapons and go home, but that's not going to happen. So of the, of the tragic, horrible, but realistic options available, I believe Ukraine should become the West Germany of the 21st century. Mm. In other words, we have experience with defending temporarily divided countries against the Soviet Union. It's called West Germany. So I think that Ukraine should establish militarily, again, I'm not saying this is what I want. I would like for Ukraine to win and for Russians to go home and for all 1991 territory to go back. So please do not understand me in the wrong way. This is not what I want. I'm just trying to be realistic. I think Ukraine should establish militarily defensible borders. I'm saying that very precisely, not internationally recognized, but militarily defensible borders. And once it has those, it should then be in NATO, in the way West Germany was in NATO, on the understanding that unification is the goal. Because I think we need a peace without Putin a peace without Putin. I don't think there is any point in negotiating with him. First of all, it is not in his interest to negotiate, number one. And number two, he has no credibility whatsoever. So I do not think this war will end in a negotiated way. I think we should define a militarily defensible border, 
put Estonia into NATO. In Ukraine, the Ukraine. Sorry, sorry. 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 <laughs> Ukraine. Thank you. Ukraine you know, into NATO. Celebrating 20th anniversary Ooh, yeah, of Estonian yeah. membership. Sorry. Put Ukraine into NATO. I think we should do it at the 75th anniversary summit, and then we should look forward to unification in the future. Mm. But I, I, I want to uh, argue with that. I mean, uh, <laughs> okay. Because, because uh, you say that you know uh, the the best solution would be that Russia lays down the weapons and uh, leaves Ukraine, and that's not going to happen. I think we also have to believe in Ukraine's victory because, you know, uh, if you think about history, yep. they, uh, I mean, yes. the war will end when Russia realizes it made a mistake. It can't win in Ukraine. Yep. Like they did in Afghanistan. They realized yep. after 10 years of fighting, yep. we can't win here because they can't, you know, uh, break the, the will and, and, and whatnot. And it's the same in Ukraine. If they realize they can't break the will of the Ukrainians, the West is behind Ukraine, supporting them with uh, with weapons and military aid, yep. uh, as soon as they realize, uh, you know, they can go back uh, to their borders and and you know, whatever narrative they come up with, pro uh, Russian propaganda, it's not really our our uh, thing to do. But I think that 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 is also possible if we take this attitude that it's it's not going to be possible anyhow. Let's negotiate. Let's draw the line. We have you know had this for a long time, and of course it has a price for all of us. Uh, I I agree. No, I'm saying no negotiation. I'm but, saying, yeah, yeah, but I mean that if you say that you know leaving Ukraine uh, uh, or letting aggression pay off, uh, that you know uh, they will have some territories. Uh, so Putting Ukraine into NATO is not letting aggression pay off. Okay, but um, let's let's. I, I'd like to to go back to this treaty or negotiation argument because that's interesting. Shortly before this year's Munich Security Conference, mm -hmm. Ambassador Heuskin has brought up the idea of uh, a diplomatic process similar to Minsk, uh, so the Minsk 1 and 2 process, <laughs> as a potential way to end the Russian uh, full-scale war against Ukraine. So, Mary, as a historian, how realistic is that? Well, just as a thinking human being, I would say not very. Mm -hmm. you, you don't need a PhD in history to see that negotiations with Putin are not a promising mm -hmm. prospect. I mean, I believe the last, you know, when it first started, the Ukrainians and the Russians, they poisoned the Russian negotiators. Sorry, they po sorry, they <laughs> jet lag. They poisoned the Ukrainian negotiators. Mm -hmm. So I do not think, again, I can't say this strongly enough, I'm, what I'm arguing about trying to cooperate with Russia, that is a historical argument. Look, Cold Wars are not short-lived affairs. So thaws are precious. We had a thaw, we had a chance for really thorough strategic nuclear disarmament. And we, we the, neither Russia nor the West, we did not make the best use of that thaw. Now we have returned to a situation of, of major land war in Europe. The, the recommendations I made were for peacetime. Now, as I said, I think we need a peace without Putin. And I think that we, again, this is not my, my desire would be that you, what you said, the Ukraine wins. I, I really cannot express how much admiration I have. I, I cannot express my horror at you know, a man who commits the crimes in Bucha, a man who bombs maternity wards, bombs maternity wards, right, is attacking Ukraine every day. I, I cannot express my disgust in strong enough terms. But I'm trying to think of realistic solutions. And I know there is this model of West Germany the, where the West Germans said when they were setting up the state, they said, we, we do not like the division of our country, but we cannot do anything about it now. So we're going to write a temporary basic law, not a constitution, and we're going to put our capital in Bonn, which is a little tiny village, not a major city. And to make it clear, anybody, <laughs> I'm sorry, just asking. <laughs> we're going to, to make it clear that this is not a permanent state. And we are then going to become a wealthy country, a strong country, a trusted mm. NATO partner, and we are going to work toward unification. That, I think, is a realistic and positive model for Ukraine, and one that could also promote foreign investment. That's what I'm saying. Mm. Madam Prime Minister, um, um, yesterday President Zelensky spoke at Munich Security Conference and he said, do not ask Ukra Ukraine when the war will end. Yeah. Ask yourself why Putin is st still able to continue it. Um, so with regard to the role of um, Ukraine and the future of Ukraine within the European family, what kind of scenario do we have to envisage if Ukraine does not win? And what does it need for Ukraine to win? 
Uh, well, what does it need? I mean, like President Zelensky said, that, that is a question for all of us, uh, that we are uh, helping uh, Ukraine militarily uh, as much as possible. We are putting political pressure on Russia and isolating them uh, on the political sphere uh, everywhere <coughs> in, in different uh, you know, international organizations and, and places where we can do that. And putting the economical pressure by, by sanctions uh, also, uh, also on Russia. Uh, I think, you know, concentrating our efforts, uh, we can have, uh, we can make a difference. Um, I mean, Putin is a dictator. Uh, dictators work like the dictator's handbook, uh, also a very good book, by the way, um, uh, uh, is, is, is writing. It, you know, it has uh, several elements. First, you eliminate all the alternatives. That is, you know, killing Navalny. Uh, so that, you know, if you see that cronies around you are looking that, okay, this guy is going crazy and uh, dragging us to the direction where we don't want to go, but you don't have every, anywhere to turn to because there's no, no alternative. The second thing is that uh, you have to, uh, you know, keep the cronies around you happy. And the cronies around him are not happy because, because of the, you know, the sanctions, uh, everything, their life has been uh, touched by this, uh, this war. Uh, but like I said, they have nowhere to turn to. And third point is that uh, keeping the army and the pow power structures happy mm -hmm. so that, because they keep you in power. They do, uh, you know, they, uh, they are fighting this war. And what we saw from the Brigosian mutiny is that uh, the army is not happy. Of course, Prigozhin was eliminated, mm -hmm. but is the army happy? Uh, they are not. So what I try, and an economical uh, uh, aspect is that uh, they try to believe that, or make us believe that, uh, you know, the sanctions don't work and they hurt Europeans more than they do uh, uh, Russians. Uh, this is not actually true. I mean, their economy is in a very bad state. Uh, the Russian uh, central bank's uh, interest rate for uh, Russian economy is 15%. Uh, uh, so, so that shows how they assess their economy doing. And their budget is in a big deficit. So that, uh, you know, our budgets, when they are deficit, we raise capital outside, but uh, due to the sanctions, they can't do that, and Chinese are not lending them. So, so uh, this, is, uh, this is the problems they have. What I want to say is that if we concentrate our efforts, this breaking point uh, could, not be that, uh, could not be that far still. And, and when uh, I think it's also a trap to, to talk about, OK, uh, when they don't win, so what we, we should do? Every time you start to talk about plan B, when you still have plan A, the plan B is going to happen. So yeah. let's focus on plan A uh, working. Mm -hmm. And then I wouldn't mm -hmm. worry right now about uh, how we deal with Russia mm -hmm. afterwards, because, mm -hmm. because that is a separate, separate issue. Uh, uh, I mean, there's nothing we can give to the Russians um, that will make them, uh, you know, better or, or will make them uh, comply with the uh, agreements uh, that we will then make. So, so we have to think about them losing this last colonial war, and then we have something to talk about. OK, so this is, um, uh, let's not, not focus on Russia too much, but focus on our, on our let's say, unity and our strength and to yes, support Yes, uh, because, uh, you know, you mentioned Minsk, uh, uh, and this is, you know, this is funny. When, when the 24th of February 2022, um, I remember we had the uh, European Council uh, meeting. And I mean, I had been telling my counterparts for quite some time that, uh, you know what Russia is doing? They are starting soon a war. And I said, no, 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 they're not starting because, you know, wars are expensive and people would do, wouldn't understand. Yes, but this is the way you look through a democratic lens, saying that, like, in a democratic country, if I would start the war, they would immediately take me down because it's a stupid mm. thing. But it's not a democracy, it's a dictatorship. So, and on the 24th of February, I saw a lot of leaders around the, uh, around the table who said, who were genuinely shocked, like really, really shocked. And I was like, why are you shocked? Mm. I mean, we saw we this. We told yeah. you so. We saw this. <laughs> yeah. uh, that was one thing. And the other thing that um, we should have listened to you. Mm -hmm. But now when I come to, yeah. now we are two years into this, yeah. And I, I, I feel that uh, this is, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should have listened to you then, 
but now we are the adults in the room, mm. yeah. so we know better. Yeah. Uh, let's sit down and do a Minsk. Mm -hmm. We have done Minsk, and uh, that has brought us more wars. So let's try the strategy that we are su suggesting, which is a peace, mm. sustainable peace strategy. Mm -hmm based on your historical experiences exactly. in the region. Exactly. But also, so. not only our historical experiences, but also the, what we got with Minsk. Mm -hmm. We got more wars. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I agree. So, ladies and gentlemen, now it's time for you to ask questions. I think, uh, you know, we, I was told we need to finish uh, at quarter past sharp, so I, I suggest that we collect three questions. So there is a lady uh, here. Please introduce yourself very briefly and pose a question and don't give lectures. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Trina Flockhart. I'm a professor at the European University Institute in, in Florence. Uh, and I have worked on NATO my whole life. So I don't know if it's so much of a question, but this is a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but we, we have, yeah, yeah, please. Well, I wanted to we go back to, to the issue of, of uh, how the global south has bought the Russian narrative mm. about uh, NATO enlargement. Because I think we're actually, I mean, there, there are several different, several very important issues going on at the moment, but there's a fight of the narrative with the global south. Okay. And what is your question? So that is, how can we win? How can we change the narrative in the global south okay. about the expansion or the enlargement okay. of NATO? Okay, let's... My, my suggestion would be to go back and look at partnership for peace in a slightly different way than, than what Mary is outlining. I still agree with it, but I think partnership for peace was a pragmatic solution to a democratic socialization process okay. of the Central and Eastern European Thank countries. You. And that, I think, the Global South would Thank resonate you. with. Thank you very much. So we keep that in mind, the Global South and the narrative about the uh, enlargement. I see, I see um, Ambassador Ilves or, uh, raising his hand. Former ambassador. Former ambassador, yes. Former president. Former, Former president. president. <laughs> so, w w how many of your titles did I forget? I'm Foreign minister, <laughs> which was the hardest part. <laughs> um, I would just say, I mean, just a comment. So it's not really a question, just because uh, the prime minister asked me. Uh, I mean, basically, uh, there was much less goodwill towards enlargement. I mean, let's, uh, if, you recall, if you read the me call memos from 20 to 2022, April, in their Spiegel, you'll see, Helmut Kohl didn't even want the Baltic states to be independent. And the, the uh, end of the 1994 German presidency, the second headline of the Financial Times was called, The Baltic States May Never Join the European Union. Mm. So, I mean, that's missing from the narrative. There was. I mean, you had the largest country in Europe fighting against the Baltic states coming in. They didn't even want us to be independent, forgetting like 1939, August 23rd. So, I mean, this is missing in the narrative. And I find it bizarre that today you see Germany and other countries against having a NATO sec gen who com might come from the East because they might know something. <laughs> um, and so just, that was just a comment on where things are. Thank I don't you. think that it is wonder as wonderful as it is. PFP uh, was, uh, I mean, since Joe Krusel, who invented the idea, was a personal friend, mm. was really a matter of keeping us quiet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. President. So, uh, I could take a, a third question, but very briefly, and then we have to, the gentleman here in the Thank you very much, uh, Thomas Vigold. I'm writing on defense. Uh, I did a podcast with Mary on this book, and what gave me the creeps then, gave me the creeps today. <laughs> she said, Hist Putin is using history as a weapon. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have upcoming May 9th, 2024, uh, 25. Exactly, next year, What yes. does this mean? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, wow. Now yeah. we are into... Mm -hmm. Future telling. So maybe, uh, Madam Prime Minister, your answer on the global on the question regarding the global south and the narrative, and then uh, Mary on the on the anniversary of the end of Second World War. Next yes. Year. 
Um, uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, regarding the Global South, we just have to talk about this. I, I, every time when we have some kind of big global summits, I try to meet with you know, the uh, representatives of the Global South to explain. And, and how I get to them is actually uh, explaining this story through uh, colonialism. Uh, because this is the language that they understand very well. I mean, uh, you know, um, how, how and, and also, every country has the right to choose their own alliances. And it's not like uh, NATO expanded uh, always, but it's because we worked so hard to join NATO, because it is in our interest and it's the will of my country. So, so uh, for, uh, for African countries also, uh, they recognize uh, that, but of course it's very hard because the narrative is very, very well uh, used. So, yeah. And, yeah, and I would say regarding the 9th of uh, May, I mean, I can't say about uh, 24, of course, but, but this is also a very interesting discussion that we have in Estonia, because we have um, uh, our Russian-speaking minority that has, uh, you know, because the Russians, you know, deported Estonians, mm -hmm. imported Russians. So, so uh, in 1920s, we had a Russian minority that is 3%. After the occupation, it was 30. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so now we have a big uh, um, a minority uh, still. But uh, they try, uh, and we have the discussions regarding mm -hmm. the 9th of May because of the Russian propaganda. And what I try to tell them is like, when they say that we celebrate the end of the war, at the end of the Second World War. Well, that's uh, not for Estonia, not but, even 45. No, but, but, uh, but, uh, but I, I, my argument is, you know, we could all celebrate uh, that mm. as the end of the Second World War, when on the 10th of May, Stalin would have said, you are all free to go because the war is mm. over. Continue your business as, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> your country, build up your prosperity. But then the atrocities for us started, the mm. mass deportations, pressuring down our culture, everything, erasing our language. Mm. So, so that's why uh, this is uh, uh, totally different different for you. Yeah. yeah. Mary. Yeah. yeah, okay, so just very briefly, we're yes. going to extend this session a couple hours, right? So I can <laughs> yeah, we could, we could do, we already registered another session. Okay, good, okay, very year's good. Okay. All right, so I, I'm going to respond, conference. these questions deserve deeper answers, but um, Trina, yes, absolutely, the point about Global South is very good. I do as many interviews as I humanly can. I've done interviews in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I, I, as I said, I, I'm trying to disarm Putin with, with the history that I know. Um, uh, President Ilves, thank you so much for the time that you gave me while I was working on the book. It was very important to me. Um, with respect, the book does discuss how Helmut Kohl, in my view rather shamefully, told the Baltics to suppress their desire for independence so, uh, uh, so Germany could achieve unification. It was very, very abrupt. So you know, don't make trouble with Russia because we need to make sure we get our unification through. So you understand, right? You Baltics can just wait some more. So the book does address that. And with respect, PFP was about Ukraine. President Bill Clinton said again and again to Yeltsin, PFP is about Ukraine. We don't want to leave Ukraine out in the lurch. We, you know, it's a little too much to put it into NATO. Although Tony Lake, his national security advisor, in 1994 talked about Ukraine being in NATO. But PFP wasn't about keeping the Baltics quiet in the first instance. It was about providing some kind of sustainable solution for Ukraine. And then finally, Tomas, to your point. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very worried because as I, I said, I, I, I noticed as a historian that Putin celebrates anniversaries with violence. Mm -hmm. So the human rights activist Anna Polakovskaya shot killed. dead at close range on October 7, 2006, Putin's birthday. birthday. The mm -hmm. release of the hacked emails from the Hillary Clinton campaign, October 7, 2016, Putin's birthday. I could, give, I could give you a whole list of things that happened on his birthday. While I have no evidence, I wonder if the fact that the war with Gaza, sorry, that the Hamas attack happened on October 7th was a result of Russian-Iranian contacts. I know the, the origins of that conflict are somewhere else, but I wonder if he had good enough relations with Iran to say, please make October 7th the go day. Yeah. Well, um, strange, strange, coincidence. strange coincidence. And also strange coincidence that Navalny is dead yesterday when yes. his wife is here. Very strange yes. coincidence, yeah. So I am actually worried about anniversaries that are less well known, but are coming mm -hmm. up sooner. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, it's now late February. On March 12th will be the 25th anniversary of NATO expanding to Central and Eastern Europe. Enlarging. 
En, sorry, enlarging. Sorry. Enlarging. I don't yes. actually see. Okay, as a native English speaker, that I don't actually see the difference between the words, but mm -hmm. I'm. I, so I'm using them interchangeably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, March 24th is the 25th anniversary of the bombing of Kosovo, which Americans can't even find on a map, but the Russians still, you know, mm -hmm. go into Very rage about of. it. And also, by the way, the U.S. bombed the Chinese embassy. We say accidentally. They say not so much. So that's coming up. March 29th is the 20th anniversary of your country joining. And April 4th is the 75th anniversary of the founding of NATO. And all of this is happening in the 25th year of Putin's reign. Now, he is obsessed with history. He is obsessed with these anniversaries. Yeah. And so I am very worried because of all of these things that and are coming up. And I think, to, inc to conclude, we need more, Madam Prime Minister, of your spirit and of the Estonian spirit. We need more of the spirit that one day no matter what, we will win. Yeah, and amen. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Madam Prime Minister Mary Sarotti, for this very inspiring conversation. Thank you all for being with us this morning. And we are told to leave immediately <laughs> because the next event is coming up. Hopefully see you again at next Excellent. Munich Security yes. Conference. Thank you. Thank you. It was a real pleasure and honor. Thank you.